Fresh. What's up, guys? Welcome to local band Smokeout. Smokeout. Any genre from, from anywhere in the entire world. I want to hear your music. I think that's that's how we do it right there. Trying to make them suffer in the building. What's up, brother? How Sorry. how's how's the day? Sorry about Sunny's guys. I got yeah, this is fucked. Oh, I see. It's a... Oh wow. Oh, what happened? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. My immune system has just been getting absolutely cooked with like allergies and shit. I just woke up like this. It was fucked. No worries, dude. So, I'm off to, off to the doctor today. Gonna get some blood tests and shit after this. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully uh, everything is smooth and the doctor says, you know, here's a little something, something is gone. Yeah. But, uh, dude, I want to start off with this. First of all, the the new album, the new record is is superb. Uh, I want to start with the first question of of why call it, why now title it the self-titled after all the releases you got, you guys have done? Does it feel like the band is tighter than ever right now? Yeah, I guess so. Um, it's sort of like one of those things where it felt like... Um, you know, it's been a long journey and I suppose it feels like all the pieces have kind of fallen into place uh, for this one where we're really happy with the dynamic um, of all the members, I'd say, is like fundamentally, you know, the most important thing. You know, we've had basically the same lineup for six, seven years now, barring our keyboardist. And then Alex was just been such a good fit for us that it felt like it's a sort of missing, the missing piece to the puzzle. So um yeah that and then also like us having a lot of confidence in kind of what we wanted to do with the album and um you know i think we've really sort of found uh like our pocket and uh, like a sound that is like original and unique to us but at the same time one that's you know reasonably like just sounds good right so um yeah i don't know it just felt like it was an exciting time for us and you know especially given the the history of the band over the, over the you know previous few years before Doom Switch, it was kind of like a pretty dark time for making them suffer, and you know through COVID and everything, and you know we were kind of on the brink of uh, collapse basically, um, and talking about calling it a day and all that sort of stuff, and then I suppose yeah the the decision to self titled the album to to self titled the album was sort of like a celebration of in a way for us and just being proud of like how far we've come all the obstacles we've overcome over the years and the fact that we're still here and this is album number five for us it's pretty i don't know it's a crazy sort of thing to look back on um the journey so yeah i'm sure you've asked this, you've answered this before in in a different q a with somebody but how did you guys find alex and and was how did you know she was the perfect fit during the audition yeah um Alex was, well, basically, I mean, we all knew Alex because she's playing this uh, band called uh, Drown This City. She was the main um, vocalist in, in that band and um, predominantly did screaming like, and then, you know, clean singing choruses, uh, I would say would be the majority of, of their sort of like song formula. Um, so, yeah, uh, Basically, um, she she was living in Melbourne. Nick was living in Melbourne, and they, you know, would sort of just bump into each other or like be in kind of the same social circles, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think they caught up one time, and um, you know, Nick was talking about you know how you know things weren't going so well for make them suffer, and she had sort of expressed the same sentiments about her band Drown the City. Um, and, you know, just kind of like had a, had a bit of a heart to heart, a bit of a DNM, and then, you know, went their separate ways. And then I think it was over the next like couple of days that it was Nick had the light bulb moment. It was like, oh, wait, why don't we just get Alex in the band? Because we were looking for the keyboardist, a new keyboardist at the time and a new, um, you know, singer. And, um, yeah, so then he approached everyone with the idea and we were, like, very, very receptive to it. Seems like a, a, a bit of a no-brainer for us. And, uh, yeah, we got, we got Alex on board from there. Yeah, the new stuff's amazing, dude. I want to ask one or two more, then I'm going to send it over to Spaz for a couple. 
who did yeah. you who did you look up to as as a young lad that that made you even want to pick up a microphone and just do what you do like and who were you practicing to 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 get your chops up as far as like your vocals it's pretty funny that i'm wearing sunglasses right now because like roy orbison was actually the roy first orbison album. really well the first album i ever owned um and i remember that it was like a greatest hits and it actually came with a pair of uh like you know, fake Ray-Ban sunglasses or whatever. That was pretty cool. But no, um, <laughs> not, uh, yeah, not, not, a, not from a metal perspective. I mean, you know, I, like probably like many people kind of my age, I sort of, I guess, I remember the first song I listened to with Screaming and became obsessed with was uh, Downfall by Children of Bodom. And then from there, I kind of got into like, um, I, I I suppose I probably got into like Linkin Park and Limp Biscuit. I think was really, really big for me. Like Limp Biscuit was probably like the first heavy like band with like heavyish parts. I suppose that I listened to. Um, and then when I was probably I don't I don't remember how old it must have been fifteen or something like that. I think I bought um, Saint Anger because <laughs> like I just wanted to hear some. I'd never heard of I'd heard the name. Metallica, and then years later, I find out it's probably... so you bought like the worst album, but but yeah, still... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. not the one to write home about. So that, and then yeah, yeah. So a lot, lot of new metal like Corn, uh, Slip, Slipknot, I guess. But you know, I I sort of like you know heard Subliminal Verses or whatever first, and then like retrospectively checked out all their previous work when I was like in my twenties or whatever. Um, cool. So, you know, my journey was a bit different to some people. Um, but, yeah, I would say I remember the first, like, songs that I was screaming along to was um, there was a song by a black metal band called uh, Carpathian Forest. I can't quite remember what that song was called. Um yeah, um, and then there was a couple, like Dimu Borgir, I think I used to scream along to. And um, then, like, from there, it was sort of weird. And then I just got straight into, like, a Muir. And, like, um, yeah, do, Job for a Cowboy, I guess, was big, the Doom EP and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Do you, um, do you recall a time in your life when, when you picked up the phone, called someone in your family, maybe mom and dad, and said, Mama, I've made it? When what was that moment when you feel like this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life? I'm a rock star. I'm a touring musician. I, you know, when was that moment? Oh shit. Um, well, the thing is, is it's been such a long and sort of slow grind for us. Is that there never has really been a a, a, a moment like that? I don't think in our career. I mean, the biggest moment, honestly, was probably just being like. <laughs> Um, yeah, explaining to my mum that I was going to be joining joining this band and going to be driving to Rockingham every weekend for <laughs> band practice. And, was she happy you know, about like, that oh, initially, or does she have like other plans for her son? And she envisioned other things. I, I think, yeah, I think probably both my parents did sort of envision other things. But you know, after, after I was like doing it for a couple of years, I could see I was really into it, and they were very supportive. So um, there was not a lot of pushback there, I suppose um just maybe at the, at the very beginning they were like oh you know a little you know they didn't want me to you know tread too far in a direction that was not gonna you know i was gonna put too many eggs in one basket sort of thing um but yeah uh shit there's the, um, the moment like a, a like a like a sort of moment to where i sort of realized that i'd made it well i guess yeah, it's it's really difficult because yeah, it's uh, like I mean, Bring Me the Horizon was definitely like a bucket list sort of band to tour with and getting to tour with them. I think doing our first tour with Parkway Drive in probably that was probably 2016ish or something like that, and that was a regional tour. That felt pretty special to us because you know Parkway Drive are a band that every Australian grows up listening to and worshiping. So um, that was one. Um, I suppose it's yeah, just just the bands you get to tour with and play alongside was pretty cool um yeah um that works that remember, works that works as the yeah. answer i'll say uh spaz yeah, i know so, you i know you have a couple of questions that you want to ask sir 
Yeah, hold up. Sorry. <laughs> hey, hey, Sean, what's up? It's, it's, it's uh, 6 p.m. over so, here, so we're, we're drinking brewskis. We're, we're excited about th about today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I got... Uh, 2008, the album comes out. 2012, you guys, I think it's Ar Aria. Uh, you guys charted at 56 with having, what is it, four years in a band. How did that make you guys feel as a band, like charting at such a young age? Um, well, the thing was, was I think we were actually, I think, to be honest, when uh, Never Bloom came out and we charted and stuff like that. I think we were a little bit actually disappointed more than anything that it wasn't really we didn't chart higher because there were other bands in the Australian metalcore scene that had charted at like you know number two or three or whatever, and then we were like number fifty six, and we were like you know we we felt as if our um, song or as if our product, our album was quite special, and I think at the time there was like. This sort of like we had this kind of like local band mentality, um, especially coming from Perth, where there's this really like sort of competitive um, sort of uh, yeah mindset that that you can get into, where like you want to you know outdo um, the other bands, and then as we've kind of gotten older, um, like we realise that it's just very much so like it's way better to think of it as like. You know, if, if another band is doing great, well, that's great because that brings up the whole the whole scene, the whole community, the whole genre is then growing as a result of another band's success and kind of stay in your stay in your lane and focus on your own stuff. So I remember at the time, like we were a little bit kind of disappointed with it, I guess. Um, but you know, I guess once again, retrospectively, you could, when you put out like an album or when you do a yeah, when you put out an album, I don't know, it's just kind of like it's this big build up and then it just gets released and you think that you're going to feel some sense of accomplishment and then, I don't know, you kind of just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you do in the, first, in the first day or something like that. But I think we were expecting like more touring opportunities and stuff from it. Um, but coming from Perth, I think it was it was pretty difficult for us to be able to yeah, get across the the rest of the country and 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 tour as much as some of the other Australian bands. So, yeah, um, it just kind of felt like it came out, and um, you know, got a couple of good reviews and stuff, and then people forgot about it pretty quickly. That's that's what it felt like from our perspectives, anyway. And that's probably why um, a lot of like um, other people, like international, or you know, other people bands have been following us since then. They probably have a different perspective on that album. Where for us. Like we felt as if it was like a failure, probably, and then other people perceive it as like this very successful, you know, iconic album or whatever. But yeah, we didn't really see much in the way of opportunity from it. So, yeah. Before before Spaz asked his next question, did uh, were you informed awesome. about the trivia portion of the show, Sean? <clears throat> no. Okay, so we we like to do a trivia a trivia portion of the show. Uh, I don't know if you're down for this or not, but we we like to grab hot sauce and have our guests have hot sauce. And I'm going to ask you a trivia question. The cool thing is you get to pick the trivia topic. But if I stump you, okay. take, take a swig of hot sauce. If I don't, I'll take a swig of hot sauce. But uh, uh, I would need to know what movie or TV show have you seen the most? Or if I look up trivia on this movie or TV show, how could I stump you? Because oh. you've seen it so many times. Shit. Um, probably try like Lord, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The okay, is there a particular <laughs> movie in the Lord of the Rings that was your favorite? <clears throat> um, I mean, it's got to be Return, right? Okay, Return of the King sounds about right. Give me a minute, Spaz. You're up. Okay, I I'm pretty sure you get this from a, a well like idiots like myself, but uh, Americans. But how often do you see like big yoked ass kangaroos like in Australia? Like, <laughs> is it like just walking down the street? I mean, I don't know about Perth, but I I've always yeah. wondered because I've seen them on Instagram where like they're fucking just brick houses. Yeah. Well, I live um, pretty like close to the um, central city. So you won't typically get a lot of kangaroos and stuff like anywhere near 
probably within like a you know a five to ten mile radius of of, of down downtown what you would call what you guys would call it um but you know um australian cities have a lot of like urban sprawls so you know it's it's very suburban and go the houses go out for quite a while probably like 30 40 maybe more miles um every direction of a city um so as you start getting into the yeah, 20 20 mile zones like that you might just see some there's a lot of like um <clears throat> uh park land and you know um protected uh yeah natural natural forest and natural park that is sort of like interwoven between a lot of the um suburbs and so yeah sometimes you'll just get like kangaroos you know my you know my friend oh my friend my drummer j man you know he was living close to the hills in midlands and like you know he'd wake up in the morning and there'd be this kangaroo that would always just be on his front front lawn that's wild eating the grass or whatever so yeah, and I, you know, my mum, she lives in Albany. Um, which I would is, totally be trying to give them drumsticks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, mum lives in Albany. That's a five-hour drive south of Perth, and that's sort of in the bush, and, you know, she's on a property there, and, like, there's just kangaroos everywhere there, you know. Like, they're just, they're, all, yeah. They're, they're all, like, as soon as you get out of town, they're all over the place, and they're sort of like deer. You can't really, um, they'll just stop in the middle of the road and, you know, deer in the headlights is the expression. That's kangaroos doing the exact same thing, you know. So, Sean, it's time to stump you on some Lord of the Rings trivia. One more you... question. Oh, go ahead, BG. Okay, all right. Yeah. Oh, we'll go back to you. you. You get to pick, though. You get, or you got to pick the trivia. I need to know. In Lord of the Rings Return of the King, who catches the bouquet thrown by Rosie at the wedding to Sam? Fuck. <laughs> uh it's like who it, was it that caught the bouquet is it mary that is not correct <clears throat> the answer is pippin pippin then smiles at the woman standing next uh, to him and uh and because she wanted the bouquet i knew it was either mary or pippin so uh, i don't know if you're down to do the hot sauce it's okay if not but uh, well, uh i've got some hot sauce but okay um, excellent I think I've got some hot sauce. I'll cut. Let me. Can I check my fridge? Sure, of course. It's not here with me, obviously. I didn't come into the room with hot sauce. No, no worries. I appreciate you being a good sport about it. Yeah. That's cool. Go ahead and get I didn't want to do hot sauce. sauce. I was hoping. I, I had some ghost pepper blueberry ready just in case, too. Uh, Bro, I'm, let me tell you, that echo really messes with you. We need, we need to go back to Discord. You can hear an echo. So I don't hear anything on this end, but I can't full screen beyond the way it I is. Do. I do. It's sucks. probably my setting. I'll have to crop accordingly when I bounce this. I do want to ask about vocal warm ups. Um, he's really elaborate answers. So we can't get a whole so, lot of yeah, other questions I was in. Gonna, I was just going to ask. Uh... I was just going to ask a quick question about like the, uh, the, what the hell is it? Not the dialect, the, um, the accent. It doesn't come out in vocals and I want to know why. That's for all bands. I would say. Uh, what you got? Well, this is the first person that I got to talk out of the country. This is the devil's tears. Oh, devil's. That, that looks like it's going to be rough. Yeah. All right, so what, just do a shot? Just yeah, let's take a little swig. I'll, I'll do it with you. We'll take a little swig. I got ghost pepper blueberry. Here we go. Oh. Woo! Oh. Yeah. Spaz. I'll holler at him <laughs> while, while we're suffering. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, Sean, um, before I ask this next question, I just want to give you uh, just a, a quick comment. Uh, Nick Miller from A Skylet Drive uh, is our producer and he said uh, you are one of his top three bands of all time. So he wanted me to give you a shout out and just say what's up. You ever oh, heard yeah. of that band, Thanks. Sean? You, you ever heard of Skylet Drive? Skylet Drive? Yeah, I think I've like listened. Like I know the logo. I know the logo. It's a very identifiable logo with the A. Um, and yeah, I've, I've definitely seen the name around. I can't think of what. The, I, I don't can't think of a song right now. But yeah, I've, I know the band. I'm pretty sure. Cool. So that's cool. So my quick question for you is, uh, 
I record and produce music and I've never had anybody that's had an accent. So as a vocalist, where does the, Aust- I, I, I know maybe it's somewhere in there, but like when you're singing, how does it just suddenly disappear? Um, I, look, it's really weird. I mean, I think for a lot of people, a lot of Australians, I think if they are singing in an Australian accent, it's something that they're very conscious of. I think like it's very natural for most Australians to sing in just either a somewhat like Brit pop accent or a, an American accent because that's all the music that we've grown up listening to. And also <clears throat> Australians naturally tend to, um, it's, I, I don't think it's a, it's a particularly nice sounding accent and we all tend to talk very through the nose, you know, like, yeah, good night, mate, how are you? Yeah, everything's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I just don't think it's a particularly like pleasant kind of sound um, in general. So I don't know, but like, yeah, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's this been this uh, wave of Australian like rock bands who um, have been singing with very, uh, you know, they're like, you know, intentionally making sure that they're singing with their Australian accent to keep it authentic and all that sort of stuff. And that's that's cool. Um, but that doesn't feel natural to me. I just um, sing in a way that, you know, I think makes the so vowels. So it is conscious that you, you, you know you're doing that. Uh, that I'm not. Uh, no, I mean this. It's no. Nah, I wouldn't say it's conscious. It's 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 the. I would I would have to be conscious. I would have to be conscious of putting on an Australian accent. I would say singing in an American or English accent for an Australian would be more unconscious. I would say for because hmm. all the songs we hear on the radio are in, in those accents. So we just kind of like I'm always singing along to those songs. That's how a lot of people learn how to sing. And yeah, that's more natural. Gotcha. I think for a lot of people. So I got kind of a two-part question. Sure. What what is Thank uh you. what is your the hardest song to perform on the new record as far as live wise and simultaneously it, while you're in the studio maybe this part was really hard to get out and regarding Mana God are you an RPG player is that where the lyrics kind of start for, for that song as far as because when I think when I hear the word mana I think of like Final Fantasy and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I guess the the hardest song to perform um is i'm assuming yeah i'd say no it would, probably would be either mana god or small town syndrome maybe small town syndrome just because the to get like it's quite a like sort of upbeat rappy kind of phrasing so to just make sure that's all in time and have it sounding good and tight oh Oscillator is also very hard to perform live for that same reason, um, especially because during the verses, like it is just basically rapping, like screamed rapping in a way, and there's it's so stripped back, so you need to be just real locked in with the grid. Um, so I actually find that that's something I haven't had to um, do before. So I've, I found performing the rappier stuff live something I've where I can kind of autopilot a lot of the other stuff. I'm like really focusing on the click track for those bits. Um, and then, yeah, I guess Man of God is just like doing a full song of lows is, yeah, a little bit more closer to something that's out of my comfort zone these days. I don't tend to do as many lows these days. So, yeah, a bit, bit between Oscillator, Small Town Syndrome, and Man of God gotcha. uh, for just hard parts. Um, and then uh, the song Man of God, yeah, I guess so. Well, I mean, I I play a shitload of um, Magic the Gathering, I suppose, is the current okay. Um, th- that makes sense. Thing that you, uh, I, I I literally last uh, just got back from um, the Australian RC last weekend. Um, a couple of days ago, I got back, um, so I competed in that. I didn't do well at the RC, but I did do really well in, in the 5K the next day, so that was good. I top eight at that and uh, made a bit of money, so that was good. Nice. Um, but yeah, so Magic the Gathering. But then I kind of so you're like a low key it. like Magic hustler on the side. Nah, that's the first, <laughs> first, first big tournament I've I've sort of done well in. I think. Um, yeah, so that is that, and then. Yeah, um, I used to play shitloads of Starcraft. 
Warcraft, which doesn't use mana, but I guess Warcraft 3 I also played a lot of. That used mana. And then from there I played a, a World of Warcraft for a few years. And obviously that, that, that was mana in that. Um, and then, yes, yeah, in Diablo. I mean, yeah, mana, mana has been um, like a resource in a lot of games that I've been interested in for sure. Spaz, we got time for one more question from you. I got one or two left, and then we're going to let Sean go. Spaz? Okay. Uh, my, my question, real quick, Sean, is uh, uh, a lot of people that watch will watch this are up-and-coming local bands. Do you have advice for them? And, and as far as like when it comes to label contracts, what should they be looking for? And then also, what would be your vocal warm-up technique right before you go on stage to play? Sure. Um, a con in terms of contracts, um, my advice would be to sign as few as possible. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good advice. <laughs> um, I think it's like, yeah, um, a lot of bands. I mean, it depends how organized you are as a band. You know, if you have someone or like a few members that are quite happy to dedicate a, lo a large amount of their time to, um, you know, being organized, answering emails, doing administerial stuff, da 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 da. I think that there's a uh, very, you know, there's, um, there can only be so much gained from something like a, a management contract. And you really need to be at a certain level, I think, to really reap those benefits to where things like are obviously going to start getting out of hand. But I mean, even, even up to a point when you, when you, touring you know around the states or whatever like if it's your first couple of tours i can still see that you know it's it's quite probable that you actually wouldn't need something like a management mm -hmm. um record labels are very much so the same where if you want to you know rec you know the uh, the notion of like making it by being signed to a label you know that's that's been long gone for quite some time i think um you can treat a label just like a bank loan is is really the main reason for being signed to a label. And if you've got cash up front to pay for your distribution and marketing for an album, um, then I would advise just never going with a label because <laughs> you don't really need it. Mm. But um, yeah, that's the thing is like, once again, that's more work. So it depends on how you want to structure your, your business and how you want to think about things and move forward but I mean if you don't need the um the upfront cash to pay for the distribution of your album and um the marketing maybe you can hire a, a separate third party marketing entity to to do your marketing for you or whatever um if you don't feel like you need that cash advance then I would advise just staying independent for as long as possible um, cause you're just going to make way more money that way. Um, but ultimately it, it's, it's a, a balancing act of, you know, how much do you realistically need? Uh, yeah, I, I guess like it's a balancing act of how much you really, how, how much work are you willing to take on? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you, are you having to work another job alongside everyone's working another job alongside the band or whatever and like how taxing is that on you how much time do you have because bringing in things like labels and management really what they do is take um a large percentage of the work away from the artist um where a, a manager can help out with a lot of the networking and administerial stuff for the artist and maybe if you have if you a band that's a bunch of you know five really shy people and you have no networking ability or no ability to um or no one that's organized enough to keep up with the administerial stuff then yeah um maybe your management is good for you i'm not sure but it's circumstantial to every band mm -hmm. and then do you uh what would be your vocal warm-up techniques uh any any rituals that you have that you always do right before you uh, step on stage and and then post show let's say you have like four nights in a row monday tuesday wednesday thursday something crazy what would you do post show to prepare for the next night oh um well um i do have pre-show rituals but it's more just like skull a red bull uh sugar free 
for sure. <laughs> Um, that's on the it's on the rider. We have Red Bulls on the rider, and I don't think I played a show without having a red a Red Bull beforehand in quite some time. So that's definitely a, a pre show thing. Vocal warm ups. Look, I think it's it's if um, a lot of people don't realize this about vocal warm ups, but essentially by talking throughout the day, what you're doing is warming up your throat. So if you're playing a gig at night time, which is um, more than likely. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite likely that your voice is already quite warmed up, but obviously doing some scales, humming, mm, mm, you know, any, any sort of thing where you can feel the vibration in your throat, um, that sort of like warming vibration, the tickle um, is good, I think. Um, holding breath and, you know, practicing, you know, lung capacity, any lung capacity stuff I think is really good right before you get on stage um yeah stretching limber up uh all that sort of stuff but um look everyone's got the i, I do the melissa cross warm-ups sometimes um I, less these days these days i'll just tend to do a bit of humming and 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 sing some scales and maybe i'll just sing along to like one or two of my you know cor favorite choruses that i'm listening to at that time and then just a, yeah a couple of little gutturals there and just make sure it's working and then just get right on so i don't yeah it's it's different for everyone but um yeah i think doing scales is always a, a good way to start and then it's kind of like you know what do you really want to focus on for that warm-up is it lung capacity is it you know opening and closing your mouth you know jaw flexibility or enunciation um there's a lot of you know things you can tackle and it's just you know what 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 do you feel for your performance needs work what's important about your set you know um and then from there i guess the the other thing is yeah so on the flip side of that oh so finishing yeah finishing the set um i uh, well uh it's i realize it's difficult for a lot of uh local bands um but something that has you know done absolute wonders for my voice on tour where i used to struggle quite a bit and no, no longer do is stop going to the merch table <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's actually shocking how bad that is like um 90 of the time when my voice blows is blown out on tour it's because i've just played a set and then gone and sold shirts to people at the merch table or thanked them for coming to the show and i just don't do that anymore because it's you know your voice is an instrument and you know you want if you want to be doing this for a long time you need to preserve it and you know some people might think you're egotistical or arrogant for not coming to the merch table and taking photos but it's like whatever you gotta look after your instrument and um you know hopefully other people in the band will understand that i i realize that in a more at a, at a, at a kind of local band level or a band in the more formative years kind of thing level um you know, often the vocal, you know, you're not able to employ a merch person. Obviously, you can't afford that. And so the vocalist is the only person that doesn't have to load down gear. So, you know, mm -hmm. there is, you, you know, you're kind of like priced into doing that. It's just come, kind of comes with the hustle that comes with being in a, you know, band in their formative years. But just be conscious of it and try to get a good night's sleep. Uh, avoid too much caffeine, more than one, one or two coffees a day. And, uh, yeah, look after yourself. Spaz, send us out with uh, the final question. Can't say Perth, but let's say a new metal band, a metalcore band. We're coming to Australia. What, where should we go? Where should we focus on in Australia? So, so before before you answer, Sean, this whole show is is, is called Local Band Smokeout. We we specialize in, in discovering local bands that should be brought to the spotlight, and we both like to visit Australia someday. Let's say we do. Wh what city in particular is it? Perth? Is it? Uh, is it wherever? And and is there like venues? What what should we be looking for over there, talent wise? I think it's kind of to elaborate. Yeah. Um, that's difficult. So, uh, like, like local venues kind of thing to play at in Australia, you're saying basically, or, or just like more sites from a sightseeing perspective. Yeah. Not, let, let's say you, you were starting out, but we're 
we're in a band that's been around for a couple of years, but we're on, our promoter got us a worldwide tour as a startup kind of band, indie label or whatever. Where in Australia should we start? And uh, I know well, it kind of d- depends on the genre, but let's just say metalcore. Where would yeah. I, sh- where would I put my darts at in Australia? Yeah, right. Well, definitely not Perth. Um, because if you were to go to Perth, you would have to buy flights um, across Australia to uh, to play any other shows, and that's going to be way more expensive for your band. So, yeah, I would say um, if you look at the East Coast, you can kind of you just do a, a you know you can there's Adelaide, it's down the bottom, and then um, there's Melbourne. So up up if you just follow your way up the East Coast, you can go Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney. Um, you can play Canberra on the way if you want between Melbourne and Sydney. Um, Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, and then uh, Brisbane. Um, and that, so you can just kind of work your way up the East Coast or start at Brisbane and work your way down, whatever you want to do. But I would just don't go to the West Coast, whatever you do. Probably don't go to Tasmania because that's – they're both not uh, – you know, they're both amazing places to play, obviously, for the, for the experience and stuff, but it's obviously more expensive because of the flights. Uh, a lot of people consider Melbourne to be like kind of like the arts hub of Australia. A lot of the like industry um, is sort of like set up there. A lot of the infrastructure and stuff. It's kind of like our our like New York City is what you're saying, or our yeah, LA kind of. Kinda... Yeah, a lot of labels, a lot of like you know talent scouting sort of stuff there. Um, whatever. So I'd say you know the arts community is very supportive in in Melbourne. Um, probably more so than any other city. And, uh, you know, uh, Brisbane is also um, one of the more booming markets, I would say. And, uh, you know, people always have a blast and get into it at at the shows in Brisbane. So, yeah, Melbourne and Brisbane, I would definitely put a pin pin in and as as a highlight and, and somewhere great to visit. But I'd say, like, it all kind of revolves around Melbourne, really. Sweet. At Make Them Suffer AU on Facebook, at Make Them Suffer on Instagram. Self titled record is out when are you guys now. coming to NorCal and SoCal? Oh, uh, I think in like next, early next year. Early next year. Well, we should be announcing it in a couple, you know, within a month or two. Dude, thank you for blessing our ears for, for many, many years of what you do. Stay safe on the road, safe travels. Hopefully the, no the I thing is, is is good to go. Thank you, Sean. We yeah. appreciate it, man. Sean and make them right. suffer. Yeah. Thank you guys. Cheers, brother. We appreciate Cheers. it. Peace out.